I've got a ton of history in playing a number of different RPGs, which began with the mainline Final Fantasy series. Having branched out a few years ago to the likes of Dragon Quest, Ease, and Kiseki, I can say that I've gained a great appreciation for JRPGs of the past. That being said, it was time for me to jump into another renowned JRPG series, Star Ocean. And what better way than the second entry, Star Ocean The Second Story R. My understanding is that this is a remake of a remake. The first version released in the late 90s for the PS1, with a PSP remake released in the late aughts. Fifteen years after that, we got this Gem Drops developed remake, which sounds like it's the definitive version. I wouldn't know as I haven't played any version before this, and well heck, any version of Star Ocean ever before that. Now if you're looking for a comparative analysis between each version, or a history of Star Ocean overall, I'd recommend Austin SV's video on the former and David Vink's introduction to the latter, which I'll include links for both in the description below. But make sure you stick around for my review of Star Ocean The Second Story R, remember to like or dislike, and make sure to hit that subscribe button. Star Ocean 2 begins with the player being asked to choose whom to lead the story and gameplay with. A human named Claude or an Expellion named Rena. Claude is transported to the planet Expel when his Star Trek-like ship is exploring an unknown land and there's an incident with some tech there. He meets Rena at Expel's Sacred Forest location, where she's frightened of his odd-looking clothes and appearance, then has her life saved by his quote-unquote light sword, his plasma gun, from monsters. Thinking he's a prophesized hero, Rena brings him back to her village of Arlia, where he realizes this is a less technologically developed planet than what his planet Earth and the Pan-Galactic Federation is. The story branches out from there as Claude and Rena continue their journey to counter a threat called the Sorcery Globe, which has rousted monsters across the planet, causing general upheaval to the overall world's various peoples. The story itself was good, albeit fairly predictable when it comes to general JRPG fare. A blossoming romance between the main characters, coupled with immature misunderstandings, keeps players engaged between these two main heroes, though side characters that can be recruited to help keep the story moving along as well. I did find some of these side characters recruited to have varying degrees of impact on the general story, though admittedly many of them are pretty one-note. Female characters feel fairly sexualized, from Celine's provocative outfit and, and Press's crush on Claude constantly being referenced, along with various dialogue throughout the, the game. Male characters also feel pretty one-dimensional too, like Ashton's poor me attitude, Leon constantly calling Claude dude, Noel being addicted to nature, and so on. But I think this is mostly because the main story is focused around Claude and Rena. And I found it pretty cool to have the ability to get a wide, diverse set of characters in the party. The dialogue Claude and Rena have with them fits this large profile, though there are a few weird spots in conversation where this sort of clashes, like Claude saying, I hope you find your mother, near the beginning of the game when the conversation doesn't reference this at all, which happens specifically after Rena heals a certain villager in Celine's village a few hours into the game. My choice for my playthrough, I selected Claude in the beginning. And once I beat the game, I was still left with a large number of questions that were never really answered. I'm going to avoid spoilers here in the entire review, but one question I had was I never really understood why Claude was transported to Expel in the beginning, and where that technology came from, beyond just guesses. I have more questions, and it's possible another playthrough under Rena's story selection will help to fill in the blanks. Thankfully, New Game Plus opens up once the game is beaten where all character stats and level progression, along with a majority of equipment and items are retained. This will make my second playthrough a breeze, especially with the battle system. And I have to say, the battle system itself is pretty decent. Battles are initiated when the player runs into an amorphous blob on the field. The player is then transported to a flat plane where they and the party fight a series of monsters. The player controls one of the characters in the party, with the others being controlled by the computer. Computer behavior can be changed either before battle or on the fly in a series of general behavior guidelines like focus on healing or spread out an attack. Computer controlled party members will also act in a certain way depending on if they are physically or magic based attackers. While magic based characters can technically walk up to enemies and attack them with their rods or staves or whatever, they'll generally hang back and just cast magic. The player can also turn off certain abilities and spells in the menu preventing computer-controlled party members from using them. 
And if you're like me and confused about this option and thought it was turning these new abilities on, you may wonder why your magic users are just sitting out in the field during battles doing nothing. Thankfully, I did figure this out pretty quickly, though not without some egg in my face and dead characters more often than I needed them to be. <laughs> the overall stats and level progression was extremely fair, too. I never really found the battles too tough as the game went on, though there were a couple times in the beginning where enemies would one-shot my party, such as with enemy mages casting Starlight. As I got into the second half of the game, I often found myself overpowered. I could tell this easily as the amorphous enemy blobs in the field change from blue to green. With the latter color allowing my party members walking in the field to immediately defeat these enemies using the ability Bodyguard. And it's these abilities and the various customization that allows the party to itself to become just overpowered. Why buy any equipment from the stores when you can just make the best armor and weapons in the game with customization and blacksmithing at level 10? Why grind forever when training and scouting are turned on or up to level 10 and allow for chain battles of 5 in a row, thus resulting in exorbitant amounts of experience points and levels gained? This overall customization was fun, but I felt that it ended up making the game overly easy. The toughest parts of the game were probably at the very beginning when these options were, weren't as high or available, or at the very end against the super bosses. And even the latter can be nerfed using the bloody armor equipment. And for me, this was all also under the universe or hardest difficulty level that, that I had selected. I do think the battle system had a couple idiosyncrasies itself that could have been fixed or improved. One big one was that no matter who takes damage, whether it's enemies or players, the same color hit point marks appear. Because of the interspersed nature of battle, I would have preferred maybe the player's party taking damage to show a different color. I also found it difficult to lock onto enemies. The player can hold R2 to select an enemy to attack, but I notice this doesn't really stick, and it becomes irksome when fighting enemies I need to attack right away lest they run away, like the Metal Scum Battles, which I loved that this Dragon Quest-esque reference. I also felt like adding a Final Fantasy XII-like Gambit system would have gone a long way for increased player engagement for party members the player doesn't control. Yes, you can queue up spells or abilities for party members not controlled, but there's no guarantee they'll actually execute them, which is another issue that I had. I suppose this is the reality for these action JRPGs like Star Ocean, Ease, Tales, and the like, though. Looking beyond the story and battle system, everything else was pretty good. I liked the combination of the 2D sprites with the 3D environments, with both of them being quite detailed. I still feel, though, like Team Asano's HD 2D games have a more cohesive look. But what we got here in Star Ocean 2, the second story R, feels like it's honoring the original source material while still looking fantastic. It just feels like a PS1 game. One example is, as soon as I exited the town of Arlia and was in the overworld of Expel itself, it kind of felt like exiting the first area in Final Fantasy 7, 8, or 9 and having that 3D overworld type exploration. The overall environments themselves were quite detailed and there were some really beautiful scenes such as various sunsets, waterfalls, as well as some of the late game environments as well. I did end up playing this game digitally through the PS5 and overall performance was phenomenal. I enjoyed 1-2 to two second load times as the game switched between main worlds and dungeons to battles and, and back and forth, and at a buttery smooth 60 frames per second too. I also did pick up a physical copy for the Nintendo Switch, though I did stick with the PS5 since I heard the Switch version had longer load times and only 30 frames per second. While I was disappointed that they didn't redo the English voice acting from the PSP version, I still thought it was pretty, pretty decent. That is, until the same voice has constantly repeated itself in battle. I grew tired of Claude constantly saying, not these guys again, at the start of every battle, or shouting Meteor Palm over and over again. Regardless of that, I felt the acting in the story itself was good. The music was interesting, I'll say. I switched from the OG to the orchestrated and back a few times to get a taste of the overall soundtrack since, again, I'd never played the original game. The various musical themes fit the story and environments quite well, but I have thoughts about the orchestrated version. Is it strange to say that I feel like it's 
over-orchestrated, many of the tracks feel overly developed with vocal backdrops that accentuate the feel of the remake too heavily. Yes, I can tell the game is a remake, thanks in part to the quality of life improvements inherent to the game being brought up to today's standards, as well as the excellent graphics. The reorchestrated music makes it feel overly grandiose in scale, and it was just something that just didn't feel or sound right. While speaking of the quality of life improvements, many additions were made that I feel make Star Ocean, the second story R, more akin to a JRPG of today, for better or worse. This includes the battle system's break, or stagger system. You know what I mean. Once a stagger bar fills up, the enemy becomes stunned and attacks can inflict maximum damage. Thankfully, more strategy tends to be employed in this, as some special abilities focus on damaging the shield that causes this break status. And it's not a JRPG of today if it didn't have fishing, right? Right? This was a new addition for this remake, because of course it is. I give Star Ocean a second story R, an 8 out of 10. Gemdrops has given a fan favorite Star Ocean game a number of facelifts and improvements to meet today's standards. Something that should be commended when you know we want to have them access a larger audience. The overall sound was good, though not perfect, with the orchestrated music somewhat oppressive. Thankfully we have the option to listen to the OG along with voice options that include a pair of Japanese voice options or even volume control to turn it completely off. The overall game looks beautiful with expressive sprites and great backgrounds, rivaling, though not completely beating, something from the efforts of Team Asano's HD 2D games. Combat is excellent with a lot of customizability, which admittedly can make the latter half of the game quite easy if used in the right way. This was the first entry in the overall Star Ocean series that I have played through, and I'm glad to have done so, especially after hearing that it's one of the best entries in the overall series. Admittedly, I'm not sure I see myself playing any other games in this series, especially if this one, the best one, didn't completely wow me. But let me know in the comments section if you've played this version, or really any previous version of Star Ocean 2 or any in the other series. If you haven't, are you interested in playing this one now or, or any others in the series? Either way, thanks again for watching and I hope you have a great day.